Let's have a word with Peter Fleming, who of course knows John McEnroe as well as anybody up in the wet room, still rather forlorn there as the rain continues to fall. Uh, Peter, we, we speak so much about great rivalries in tennis. For you, was Borg against McEnroe the greatest of them all? It was great because there were two completely different personalities. Borg, the the just the stone face, and and Johnny Mac was, you know, he was pretty volatile. And so, but also the the lefty uh, attacking net rusher and the right-handed baseliner. It, it was it was perfect, really. Yeah. Seven wins apiece for them. Of course, Borg never won the U.S. Open. How did that um, elude his grasp? Do you feel? Oh, gosh, I think, um, you know, anything that could go wrong did go wrong. Four finals. The, the one year, I remember he lost in the final. He was distraught because his, his great friend, um, what's his name? Um, the, the Formula One driver died that morning. You know, that, was, that wasn't easy to play. Uh, he, he played Roscoe Tanner one year under the lights, said he couldn't see the serve, lost that one. And, and uh, you know, he just... He lost a great match to Jimmy Connors on on uh, the green clay at Forest Hills. Uh, you know, it's. It, I guess sometimes it's just not destined to be your place. No, not written in the stars. Uh, I mean, you're still playing um, with Johnny Mac. Is he still as competitive and you know as physically demanding as he was back there in, in 1980? You had a mixed doubles match out in Westchester somewhere yesterday, didn't you? <laughs> Yes, it was very intense, Marcus. <laughs> we played for at least a half an hour. Uh, it's fun. It's always fun to get out I, on the I court. I thought with that him. whenever he went on court, he was still the feisty, snarly John McEnroe that we came to know and, and either love or hate in, in the mid 80s. Uh, you know what? He is very competitive. And, and, uh, and yet we played a little exhibition with two 13 year old girls. And so I, I think even he draws <laughs> okay. the line there, okay? <laughs> Fair enough. We heard him talking about Andy Murray as well. Of course, you, you've been following Murray for a number of years. Um, do you agree with, with Johnny Mack that Murray's got the most to gain over the next couple of weeks and perhaps the most to lose as well? No. What's he got to lose? Well, it, the pressure. I mean, the fact that he's got that Olympic gold medal and everyone said, you know, this is the moment he can kick on from here. And if he now doesn't achieve it, it's a, another year gone by and a, a major where one of the big four wasn't playing as well. Yeah, well, that's going to be the case uh, uh, for as long as he doesn't win one of these. You know, every time he plays uh, and does not win, people will say, well, he's getting old. You know, he's never going to happen. And, and, you know, so be it. Deal with it. I, you know, I, I think that, that um, maybe we're reading a little too much into this Olympic thing, you know, that, that, that okay, because he's won such a big event, in his hometown that he'll relax more and he'll know what it's like to to, to win one but but I, I do think that the team GB thing really was uh, an aid to him it helped him relax and helped deflect some of the the pressure off of him um, so I'm not sure how much impact that's going to have on on how well he plays how he reacts to the whole situation is back to Andy against the world you know just the, his team against 127 other guys uh, so it won't be uh, it, you know it, it's it's it will be interesting to see if if the Olympics actually helps kick him on but I don't think that there's any more pressure here than there was at Wimbledon or the French or the Australian before that well, hopefully we'll get an early indication of his form sometime this afternoon. I'm going to have to ask you about the weather, Peter. I know you're moving back to this part of the world. Are you sure you want to? I mean, it seems to rain the whole time we're here, either at the beginning or at the end. I mean, what is going on? And where's that roof? <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? It is. Uh, I, all, everybody in the UK has said to me, why on earth would you want to move out from a place that has such wonderful weather? Not. Nobody in England, you know, actually the weather is pretty good in the UK and everyone complains about it, but that's another story. It does seem to rain a little bit when we get to Fleshy Meadows. Maybe it is just because we are, we're so super aware of it because there is no roof. I, I, you know, that, we've, we've talked about this till I am blue in the face, aren't I? <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and uh, it was a bonehead play back in 96 when they designed this stadium. It's a beautiful stadium, it must be said. And uh, it, it's, uh, but but they they didn't think ahead to put a roof on it, and uh, and now because it's so massive, they can't put a roof on this thing. I mean, they really can't. It's 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 would just be cost prohibitive, and and it would it would ruin the effect of the stadium. So, 
So what are they going to do? I, you have to think that, that the pressure keeps building a little bit. Okay, well, maybe we have to think of Arthur Ashe too. I don't know. Yeah, well, uh, I guess we'd rather have the rain at the beginning of the fortnight than at the end of it. Peter, for the moment, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, just a, a, 